Can you hear me? Yes. We can hear you. Yes. Okay, great. Um, well, uh, yeah, hello everyone and uh, welcome and uh, thanks for, for attending. Um, so my name is Johannes Blaschke. I am a, um, a, an engineer here at NERSC that's coming at this very much from the classical computing perspective. And I thought um, helpful just to very quickly um, sort of set the context for, for this panel. Um, uh, so my, my work at NERSC involves um, supporting um, real-time data analysis out of experiments. So imagine um, you have a particle accelerator or microscope and you want to very uh, rapidly analyze data so you can make decisions about your experiment. Um, and so I'm, I, this is also my perspective around uh, quantum computing. Obviously, I'm not saying that this is the only perspective. I just want to set some context. Um, all right. And so uh, we have uh, an awesome panel assembled here. Um, and I think it would be uh, really helpful if all the uh, panelists, Sans Kazra, who, who's already introduced himself. Um, so it would be really useful to have all the panelists introduce themselves and uh, just briefly um, give their background. Um, I don't know if, uh, let me know if you have slides that you want to show. Um, we have probably time for one quick slide per panelist. So um, uh, with that said, um, maybe I will start uh, with, uh, let's see, is Alex on the line? Yes. So Alex. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I do have one slide. Let me share real quick. All right. Uh, you can hear me, right? Sorry? You can hear me, right? I can hear you. I assume All everyone right. can as well. <clears throat> well, it's very nice to be here. I, I appreciate this invitation to participate. Uh, my name is Alex McCaskey, for those of you I haven't met yet. Um, a little bit of background about me. So my research focus over the last, you know, eight, nine years or so has really been on uh, languages, compilers, and associated software tooling for heterogeneous quantum classical computing. So really thinking about like, uh, you know, kind of moving away from this remote execution model that we're so familiar with currently, and what happens when we do start to uh, integrate classical and quantum resources together in a kind of more familiar uh, uh, fashion like we've seen in, in recent uh, heterogeneous classical systems? Um, can we really use a QPU as an accelerator to an existing heterogeneous computing environment? That's kind of what I've been focused on. Um, just to kind of go down the list here, I got my uh, graduate degrees uh, in pure physics at Virginia Tech. Uh, where I was focused a lot on uh, modeling electron transport across single molecule magnets. And so this was an opportunity for me to really kind of uh, hone in on uh, some interesting kind of qubit, potential qubit technologies, but really to kind of build out uh, a lot of my background in software engineering and computational physics that I, that I have since leveraged uh, kind of in future or uh, uh, jobs uh, after my graduate degrees uh, were completed. So after that, I moved on to Oak Ridge National Laboratory. I was born and raised in Tennessee, so this was a very good fit for me. Uh, I, uh, I started in 2014 as staff at, in the Computer Science and Math Division uh, at Oak Ridge National Lab uh, in the Computer Science Research Group, and then later on in a group that was formed for Beyond More Technology, so specifically thinking about things like quantum and neuromorphic. Uh, I did a lot of work in leading kind of a lot of the software efforts around Oak Ridge at the time. Uh, I was the software research lead for the quantum Computing Institute at Oak Ridge National Laboratory. Uh, I also uh, had an opportunity to lead a couple of research thrusts in different DOE projects uh, that ORNL uh, had received funding for, specifically the uh, quantum computing app uh, app application team project, as well as the advanced research in quantum computing project. Both of these were kind of the Stack QC project from Oak Ridge and then the Aid QC project. And both of these really focused on the two pictures you see on the right here. Uh, XACC, which is a uh, quantum uh, programming model and associated implementation for uh, this idea of kind of heterogeneous quantum classical computing in C++. And then QCore came kind of as a kind of building off of that foundation as a kind of first of its kind C++ compiler for quantum computing in kind of a single source programming context. So then after Oak Ridge, I actually have been at NVIDIA about a year, uh, coming up November 1st, it's been about a year, and I'm uh, the quantum computing software architect here at NVIDIA, and I'm the technical lead for this new uh, programming model called CODA, the Quantum Optimized Device Architecture. 
but we're really trying to learn a lot from the CUDA world and kind of apply that in the uh, kind of uh, quantum computing world. So, so I'll go ahead and stop. That's kind of my brief background. And, and like I said, happy to be here. Thank you, Alex. Um, next up, we have Nate. Okay, let me see if I can share a slide. Trying to see where the stop sharing button is. Oh, I think Alex has to unshare. Oh, there we go. Got it. Okay. I couldn't find it for a second there. All right. Okay, let me know if you can see this and if you can hear me. I can see and hear it. Okay, great. <laughs> okay, so hi, everybody. I'm Nick Emelke. I am the CTO at Quera Computing. So I actually put a slide together to introduce Quera Computing. Uh, but I will say a few things about myself. I'm an atomic physicist, a physicist by training. Uh, so I've, I've been doing that for about 25 years since I met uh, Steve Chu, who uh, uh, helped uh, invent laser cooling. That's one of the core technologies that we use to build quantum computers here at Quera Computing. Uh, so we actually do a, a range of different things. Uh, the company started in about 2019. We're up to about 40 people now. And uh, we do basically the full stack of quantum computing all the way down to the hardware. And the hardware that we build is based off of neutral atom technology. So you can see an example of that down the, the bottom left uh, uh, corner of the slide, uh, where you can see a grid of uh, little purple dots. Each one of those dots is actually a single atom that's been laser cooled uh, and held in an optical tweezer and then moved uh, on a two-dimensional plane uh, to form a kind of quantum register. And so this is kind of you know a, a very nice scalable platform uh, for building quantum technologies out, and, and in particular for doing uh, uh, scientific applications today uh, in the realm of quantum simulation. So we can build machines right now uh, that have hundreds of qubits, and we're putting them on the cloud as we speak. Uh, we'll have some news on that in, in probably about a month or even just a couple of weeks uh, if things go well. Uh, and uh, basically everybody on the phone right now can access these machines once that happens. Uh, we also build software, um, and this is another uh, place where uh, what query computing does intersects well with uh, high performance computing and with supercomputing. Uh, we also build uh, tools that allow us to understand how these quantum processes that are so large in scale uh, behave. Uh, most of them, truthfully, uh, are above the simulation threshold. They're not easy to simulate with, with classical hardware, uh, but we do have tools, um, software tools that will help you uh, simulate uh, our systems up to the 60 or 70 qubit scale. Uh, we also have people in-house that work on designing algorithms uh, and fitting to applications uh, on this specific hardware as well. So if you call us up, uh, say that you are interested in a particular problem, we have a team of people that will think hard about that problem and how to implement quantum algorithms uh, on this uh, neutral atom architecture that we built. Uh, so, you know, we have a very solid scientific founding. Uh, we work very closely uh, with research groups uh, at Harvard and MIT. Uh, the company was actually founded by people who came out of uh, laboratories of Misha Lukin, Vladen Vuletic, Marcus Greiner, uh, and Dirk England as well. And uh, you can right now uh, start using these machines with us. So our product lineup uh, consists of a quantum processor. Uh, we're launching our, our first device, which is called Attila, uh, over the next couple of months. And then also uh, the software tools that help with that. So uh, you can look online and find all of those kinds of things. Uh, but I think I will uh, not take too much of the panel's time up with uh, more introduction for myself or my company and, and hand it off to the next. Thank you, Nate. Um, next up, we have Anna. Hello, let me share my slide really quickly. Okay, so. All right, so hello, my name is Anastasia uh, Woodco, I go for Anna. Uh, so I am a career scientist at the computer architecture group um, at AMCR at LBNL. Um, so I um, just will quickly tell you about my background. I don't, ha don't have any background uh, in quantum computing. I got my uh, digital design and electronics degree uh, at uh, National Technical University at Kiev. Uh, and then I got a microelectronics master in Montpellier, France. And then I, I had my PhD in um, HPC architecture simulation in France as well. So as you can see, I don't, not necessarily a uh, quantum uh, scientist, but uh, when I uh, joined the lab, I was, uh, I expressed my interest and I've been lucky enough uh, to be invited to participate in um, quantum projects. So. 
Uh, briefly, my uh, uh, research interests are, um, so I'm, I'm working on designing the uh, control hardware for quantum and um, among other efforts, my current project include the uh, advanced quantum test by, uh, where I'm developing quantum ISA as kind of an efficient um, uh, software and hardware interface. So if you ever heard about Quasar, uh, so I am uh, uh, who is working on that. Um, so I'm also uh, interested in uh, in the computer architecture group um, uh, that is now uh, uh, led by John Schauf. Um, he, uh, so as, as you well know, he uh, he's working a lot in the beyond wars. Uh, uh, technologies and architecture. So superconducting electronics is one of the um, of, of the potentially promising technologies. So I've been involved in this. Uh, so we have a super tools IR program. And uh, within this program, we're also uh, exploring uh, if we can, you know, do cryogenic control for quantum, uh, like a, like a quasar at 15 millikelvin or something like that. Um, and yeah, so I'm also interested in different architectures at the edge. Um, and uh, and we are using a lot of FPGAs uh, and new technologies related to the FPGAs to uh, building the prototypes and uh, um, exploring different architectures. So that's my broad background. <laughs> so here we go. Thank you very much. Um, next up, we have uh, Ravi. Hey everyone, let me just share a slide real quick. Can you hear me well? I can hear you and I can see the slide. Great. Um, so, um, Thanks everyone for having me. I'm Ravi Nayak. I am an experimental physicist uh, by background and practice. Um, I did my PhD at the University of Chicago uh, in 2018. And um, there my work focused on uh, multimode circuit quantum electrodynamics. So specifically um, using resonators as, uh, as a quantum memories. Um, uh, here at at Berkeley Lab, I am the head of measurement at the Advanced Quantum Testbed, which you heard about uh, from Castro's talk. Um, and so I won't go too much into detail there, but just to highlight some of the research efforts that I've been involved in um, as part of uh, the AQT. Um, uh, generally three broad areas, uh, quantum control. So being able to enable the uh, sort of novel types of, of, of control that are capable on superconducting quantum processors, uh, including work with uh, ternary quantum logic uh, and the um, uh, multi-qubit gates that Castro uh, highlighted earlier. Um, uh, furthermore, we've also been working on uh, understanding how, uh, how noise affects uh, quantum processors, uh, one of the most important uh, issues, uh, in my opinion, uh, uh, with uh, quantum processors. Um, and along these efforts, uh, both being able to benchmark uh, quantum processors and understand uh, how these errors behave in the context of uh, algorithms on cells. Um, and uh, along those lines, uh, we've been uh, working on uh, techniques to sort of optimize um, how these uh, algorithms perform, uh, given the capabilities of our processors and also um, the noise that affects them. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um... And uh, finally, um, we have Norm. Um, um, one second. I, I can see the slide. <laughs> you can or cannot? I can. I can. Okay. <laughs> All right. Can you hear me? I okay. can. Hi, I'm Norm Tubman. Uh, thanks for having me on the panel. It's great to be here. Um, I'm a research scientist at NASA Ames. I have two or three quick slides. Uh, so uh, a lot of people introduced their background. My background as an undergrad was computer science. I did my PhD in physics at Northwestern, and then I did postdocs both in physics and computational chemistry. Uh, all my work is more on the computational side. Uh, so I've been working on algorithms to solve chemistry, physics problems, lattice models, things like that, things that have to do with Hamiltonian simulation classically. And in that regard, uh, 
you know, I spent a long time working with HPC resources, trying to figure out how to optimize these algorithms, where the largest systems or the most complicated problems we can solve on the classical side. Uh, and in the, you know, and so I have some examples on the slide of various molecules we've looked at over the years. We've done some having benchmark, heavy benchmarking of some simple molecules like benzene on the bottom left there. We've done some more complicated transition metal stuff like iron porphyrin uh, in the middle there, and even larger like metal organic frameworks and things like that. So there's a lot of material science problems in chemistry and you know physics lattice models that you know I've been interested in in my studies. Uh, Quick summary of what you know I'm working on in, right now in terms of papers and trying to understand how all this fits on to quantum computers. Uh, you know, I'd say broadly, uh, I've listed some three questions here that have been sort of the focus of my research in the last few years, uh, and a lot of it's on where's this interface between what we can do with classical computing and where will quantum computing really pick up and help us push forward into new directions. And I have a couple papers listed here that sort of represent various you know, activities that I do in terms of my research, which is developing new classical algorithms. I'm an example of something we called ASCII, which is a configuration interaction type method that we developed in the last few years. Uh, we developed new quantum algorithms in my group. So I have an example here that I worked on with people at LBL uh, that uses various applied math techniques to try and accelerate uh, the way we can get convergence to ground states and other properties of chemical systems. Uh, I do a lot of benchmarking uh, with large groups of people who have their own classical or quantum algorithms, and we try and compare the efficiency of algorithms and try and understand what the state of the art is. And I also develop a lot of open source software with various collaborators on the side, which I have here on the bottom left, an example of a quantum Monte Carlo code we wrote called QMC Pack uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, so that's a quick summary of me and the different research techniques uh, that I'm involved with. Thank you. Um, all right. So um, thanks uh, for, to the panel for introducing themselves. Um, I, I said in the chat that um, I encourage the audience to um, ask questions in the um, in the chat um, as we now transition to the discussion part. Um, I also uh, would like to encourage the audience to uh, raise their hand if they want to ask a question and we can um, uh, you know, shepherd this, um, uh, shepherd the questions. Um, however, maybe I will start uh, by asking sort of somewhat of a broad uh, question that's relevant to NERSC, um, to the whole panel. Um, and so in the future, uh, what role do you see uh, HPC playing um, uh, around designing, building, and operating quantum computers, uh, using quantum computers to solve hard or useful problems? Um, and how do you see this changing when we transition from NISC to the four tolerant regime? And so what I'm going to do is maybe I'll just uh, call on uh, one of you, and but I encourage the whole panel to, to join in uh, the discussion. I might call on other people as well. So maybe I will actually uh, just start and ask Anna if, if uh, you have any thoughts on these points. Uh, so I will start from the end. So you, you said what's going to change, um, mm -hmm. you know, when we transition from this to uh, something different. So I think that the the kind of um, the the main difference uh, is going to be that the way it's working right now and the way it's probably going to work in the NISC uh, most of the NISC uh, air computers is it's very experimentalist kind of oriented. So it's different from the way that uh, people are using uh, NERSC resources. I as, so I understand. Um, so being like an experimental uh, computing means that that uh, you need to have a lot of support from the experimentalists, from the physicists. So you cannot do this alone. Uh, you need to have you need to have help. Um, then uh, yeah, so there is no kind of clear uh, protocols. There is no clear standards. Most of the um, most of the uh, problems that are demonstrated right now uh, they are um, oriented at like uh, proof of concept and not in actually solving the problem. 
um, and um, and the metrics that you know I kind of I used uh, for those experimental computing are also oriented into like uh, exploring the quality of those computations and not actually you know uh, computing like solving the problem. So. Um, until until all of those you know uh, points are cleared, uh, we won't be able to transition. Or oh, well, not not because of that. Well, well, and those are the kind of major differences that I see in between like the experimental computing and uh, like the regular computing. So um, once we once we transition, we'll we'll see like something different. So I'll I'll just stop talking here. I, yeah, I'll take all of the time if not. <laughs> Uh, does anyone else want to uh, uh, volunteer to give an answer before I call on someone? All right, no, I'm no happy, one. Yeah, I'm happy to say something. Uh, I mean, you gave a multi-part question. I'll try and say a couple things about the first part. Um, so you asked, um, what's the role of HPC in designing, building, and uh, operating quantum computers, and uh, you know, I'm a part of a bunch of different uh, collaborations. Uh, we're part of, you know, one thing that I'm a part of is a, a DOE center at Fermilab. Uh, it's called SQMS. And uh, we're using various levels of computing, not all of it's HPC, but, you know, uh, you know multi-core processors at the very least. And some of it is HPC to do uh, different parts of designing a quantum computer there. Uh, one aspect that I'd say is that uh, we're looking at material science questions. And this isn't my expertise per se, but people are starting to do density functional theory calculation, phase field calculations within our center to try and help experimentalists uh, build better hardware to do better design of materials. And I think that's an, uh, that might not be underappreciated, but it gets less press in terms of where HPC can really help out. But there are definitely material science problems uh, that we're interested in. Uh, the other aspect I'd say that we're looking at now, and this you know comes up a lot, there's a there's a lot of different architectures out there, uh, and within our center uh, at SQMS, we're looking at QDIT systems and trying to design gates and you know efficient gate sets and the pulses for these gates also takes a quite a bit of computing power. So I just wanted to bring up those two things that uh, you know have been really discussed within some of the things that I'm working on recently, but there's certainly a lot of other places uh, where some of the other panelists might uh, discuss in terms of designing new algorithms uh, and testing out QDIT architectures also. Yeah, actually, maybe I can follow up there. I think Norm and Anna grabbed both of, uh, most of these points, but I can think of kind of basically five areas that the quantum computing and, um, and HPC or supercomputing kind of intersect. One is, you know, doing things with a quantum computer that you would otherwise do with HPC systems. And I think there's some great pie charts from the usage of, of NERSC facilities that, that really help you understand, like, what areas to, to attack or things like that. The second one is, and, and people touched on this already, simulating the performance of quantum computers and using them to affect the design and so forth. Uh, the third is hybrid quantum computing. And... Um, you know, I'm not sure anybody's really put their finger on the exact use case or need for having massively scaled classical computing working in tandem with quantum computing, but I think it's probably not long before we do that. Um, and, you know, that's essentially using high performance computing to make quantum computing better in a sense. You could also do hybrid in a different way, which is using the quantum computer to make the high performance computing better. And I think there you might think of quantum computing as essentially being a hardware accelerator that on very specific problems, you know, might be able to give an advantage. Obviously, we're not quite there yet. But the fifth one, and I think this one is really interesting, especially now, is that supercomputing facilities form a great uh, kind of framework for figuring out how to construct things like user facilities. Uh, where you have, you know, scientifically literate people who are using these, these um, kind of novel machines, uh, but need a lot of interaction with the people on the ground who are building the hardware to try to find a way to make it work. And I think that's, that's actually probably the biggest asset that we have in working together is that we already have a, a preformed idea of how to make those interactions between the users and the hardware developers really work. 
So that's my spiel. That's that's my five areas. <laughs> that that's really interesting. Thank you. I would add on. I tend to agree with everything that you just mentioned. Uh, I think that uh, when I see when I heard this for, this question first, I thought, all right, building, designing, and operating quantum computing. Where does HPC fit into this? And I think in the near term, you're really going to be reliant on HPC and multi GPU architectures to uh, allow programmers to interface with that potential uh, quantum resource in an emulated way, right? And so uh, starting to think about, uh, you know, what kind of algorithms I can start to experiment with. Uh, maybe they're kind of purely quantum algorithms, but maybe they are hybrid that incorporate some kind of pre and post processing on GPU resources, GPU and CPU resources. Um, but the HPC system really sits in as an emulated QPU, right? And so you're starting to see this with some of the, uh, the simulation technologies that have come out in the last few years. You know, one that I was involved in at Oak Ridge was this Tensor Network quantum virtual machine simulator uh, that kind of leveraged different, you know, tensor decompositions to kind of scale out how much, how many qubits you could potentially consider in a simulation. But now, of course, with NVIDIA, we have, you know, great backends for existing simulators with QQuantum and QTensorNet and QStateVec. And so I really think that in the next five years, five to 10 years, potentially, that the HPC resource, the classical HPC resource will be this perfect kind of, you know, uh, testing ground for us early on in algorithm development, but also in programming model development. How do I interface users with that combined resource? Uh, how do I interface with them and provide them an efficient programming model? Thank you. Um, uh, maybe. Uh... Ravi um, or Kazra, um, would you like to give maybe a, a, your, your um, uh, more experimental oriented uh, perception? Uh... Yeah, I'd be happy to. Um, so along the lines of, uh, I'll give this perspective uh, specifically for super interacting qubit platforms. Um, from our perspective, um, uh, what makes, I guess, uh, uh, our qubits different than uh, sort of many of the, the atomic type of qubits um, is that uh, all of our qubits are uh, unique in the sense that uh, they're macroscopic uh, objects. Um, and due to this, they uh, can have variation um, due to uh, fabrication um, uh, inaccuracy. Um, and uh, really getting this uh, design to uh, performance um, uh, chain uh, secure, I think, uh, requires a really accurate simulations, especially if you start going to scale. Um, and we quickly find that when we design these things, if we try to lay out you know, many qubits uh, on, on a single chip, it can uh, quickly get uh, very computationally um, expensive to um, simulate the uh, electromagnetics of that uh, system. Um, and, you know, we have proxies and we can do it quite well and we can do it, uh, we think we, we've shown uh, with, the, with our performance um, uh, below the 1% level um, and even down to the 0.1%. But if we want to get to the point where we're making fault tolerant uh, quantum computers, we really need to um, uh, push that even further um, and push that on scale even further. Um, and that can be a challenge. I um, will we be able to do that with uh, HPC? I think we need to be smart with that. We need some combination of, of proxies uh, that can scale to larger systems uh, and also be able to throw a lot of compute at, to, at it. So, so what you say that that is the biggest challenge uh, for scaling quantum hardware in terms of just number of qubits or gate depth, um, or, or are there other um are scaling challenges um, that you foresee? So I, I think you're pointing out what is the, the central issue is that um, that we have good ways of understanding um, how errors are at the local scale. Um, and we really have a good sense of, of being able to optimize on that scale. Um, and while we can push a bit further, you know, we're already meeting um, thresholds on that uh, for, for uh, for uh, gates and, and queued performance on, on the local scale. Uh, however, um, understanding how errors uh, transform, evolve as we scale up uh, is really challenging. Um, and in particular for superconducting qubits, uh, 
because the environment for each qubit can be considerably different. Um, and uh, the qubits themselves can have variants. Um, uh, being able to uh, predict how that will uh, scale is it can be a real challenge. Um, and if we're trying to build, uh, say, you know, a thousand qubits per logical qubit, um, then transitioning to that that fault tolerant uh, limit may be uh, more challenging than just understanding what the local uh, error landscape is. Right. Uh, thanks. Um, maybe this is a, a good segue to uh, Nate. Um, can you give us your perspective about um, neutral um, atoms and why you believe in this technology? <laughs> yeah, obviously, I, I put a big personal bet on it. So, uh, you know, I might give a little bit of a biased response. But, uh, uh, you know, I in, in some sense, um, some of the strengths are, are uh, Ravi alluded to, which is that uh, with neutral atoms, we, we don't have to work too hard to make every atom identical. Um, in fact, uh, you know, that's that's the way they come by design. Uh, so, you know, we we don't spend as much time learning every individual qubit. In fact, we're, we're prone to throw them away in uh, every quarter second or so and, and load up some new ones with the confidence that, you know, very much like the second is defined by oscillations and atoms, uh, you know, our qubits are that good. Um, we have other problems uh, with scaling things up. So, I mean, I, I don't want to give you a too optimistic of, of a view. It's very easy for us to go up to even now thousands of atoms is, is something that we can build today. What's hard for us to scale up is, is the control of those atoms and to do so in a way that, that allows us to, to get to high fidelity gates with all of those qubits. Uh, so programmability is really a challenge for us. And, and so much so that the first devices that we're making now are not fully programmable devices. Uh, we're, we're using them for quantum simulation, things like that. And in fact, we don't have a single control channel per per atom in our machine right now. Uh, but we're working hard to do that. So, you know, we we have a an uphill battle in that sense of um, now that we have been able to find a way to get to very large scale. Uh, now, now we have a different kind of engineering challenge, which is how, how do you control all those qubits? So we have to look into new uh, hardware to do that. Um, we have people on our team who are using integrated photonics, um, which is itself kind of an edge technology uh, to try to build uh, laser beams that can control atoms uh, precisely enough to do high fidelity gates and do that at scale. Um, you know, we've the technology is still moving very fast. We had a big discovery. Uh, within the last year of how to move atoms around in real time and preserve their quantum coherence. Uh, that's that's huge because it does it means that we no longer need a single laser control beam uh, for every atom in the device, but we can move them to the control beams. Um, so you're starting to see some of the kinds of things that that um, were essential for making classical computing move forward, uh, which is you know essentially how do you multiplex control? Uh, in a quantum computer. And um, now that we're starting to solve some of those challenges, I think we're, we're overcoming the primary hurdle of scaling up control in, in, in the atomic systems. So, I mean, the simple answer is it's easy to go to scale um, so big that, you know, we got to build the machine to see what it's going to do. I think that's exciting. It means that, that every machine that we put out, um, you know, it's, it's unique on Earth. Uh, even supercomputing facilities can't tell you what they're going to do. Um, that's exciting, uh, but the next step is is to try to get the control in so that we can actually fully program the devices. Right. Thank you. Um, and actually, this is um, th there's a question um, directed uh, to Alex in the chat, um, and I think it it can actually be generalized to to other people. So please chime in if you have any uh, thoughts. Um, um, so the the question uh, sings the praises of cool quantum. Um, and then asks, so then Kareem asks um, uh, if you can open source examples um, and, and also mentions that uh, resources like the manual um, are scarce with, um, with these examples. Um, so maybe also more broadly speaking, um, I think a lot of us in HPC have this uh, worry that, you know, it's very hard to find resources about um, learning quantum uh, computing. Um, so maybe Alex, you can uh, answer the question, and then if other people want to chime in with their uh, perspectives. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, so you know, I'm I'm not on the Q Quantum engineering team per se. I'm more on the Coda uh, programming model side. But 
Uh, I do work with those folks all the time. And I do know that there are public examples. Uh, they're under uh, GitHub, uh, under the NVIDIA organization. Uh, so you can go check those out. The, the figures that were, the benchmark figures that were shown this GTC, I believe are currently uh, in, you know, somebody else probably, uh, you know, one of the product people could correct me, but they're, they're still internal. Um, but I'm sure that they'll probably be, you know, open sourced at some point in the future. Um, and I'm sure that there will be a, you know, Python example for that as well. No, I think that the kind of, you know, overall documentation and textbook question for interfacing classical HPC domain computational scientists with quantum is a really good question. And I think that you're starting to see it with, you know, a few efforts here and there. Um, I think that one resource I like to point people to is the, the QuizKit textbook is a really nice uh, resource for kind of learning a lot of the early uh, kind of textbook uh, algorithms and algorithm implementations out there, and then kind of taking that and porting it to other frameworks is relatively straightforward. Um, but I think that it gets at more of a, a more general question about kind of workforce development um, and, you know, kind of developing programming models that are at a high enough level that kind of get us away from the kind of core quantum circuit construction kind of methodology and kind of bring it more toward the, you know, typical types that we're interested in, like integers and floats. And can I do algorithms on integers and floats in the quantum uh, register instead of the classical register? Uh, but then also kind of thinking about presenting these hybrid algorithms, uh, hybrid quantum classical algorithms in more of a uh, application centric way and abstracting away the details of the underlying quantum, you know, ISA essentially, right? Like the, the gate set, you know, those are things that we're currently working on in NVIDIA. And I know a lot of people are working on, uh, you know, kind of across the field, but that I think will be necessary to really kind of bring the existing HPC domain computational science research uh, community uh, on board with leveraging quantum co-processing in these existing heterogeneous workflows. Yeah, thank you. Um, any, anyone else have uh, perspectives on this? If not, I'm going to actually ask Norma a question. Um, are uh, variational algorithms ever going to uh, work at scale? And, and with that, we mean show quantum advantage. Um, and and also, are there alternatives to um, hybrid algorithms? Sorry, are there alternative hybrid algorithms that are promising? Hi. Um, okay. Uh, this is. I feel like this is a tricky question, um, and there's going to be a lot of opinions on this. And I know QR has some papers on this also, uh, where they tried to do some variational stuff at pretty large system sizes. So no, no pressure, Arm. You, you're just going to have to predict the future for everybody. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> what I'd say is I think there's a lot of different promising routes uh, in which variational algorithms might be uh, useful. Uh, right now, I'd say other than, well, let's just say if we were to focus strictly on, say, quantum chemistry applications, trying to uh, see where things are right now on qu uh, quantum hardware, I don't think I've seen uh, almost anything on superconducting hardware, at least that's more than like 10 to 16 qubits. And if, if that's indication, it might be quite hard to scale up to larger system sizes. Uh, but that being said, uh, we do have a lot of tools in which we can optimize in the presence of noise. Uh, there's no inherent reason we can't scale larger. Um, and I do think it's a fundamental algorithm that is needed now and might also be needed in the future, even when we do have fault tolerant hardware. We're going to need to do state preparation quite broadly. There are lots of different algorithms to do it. Variational algorithms still might be prominent even uh, as we go forward with quantum hardware uh, advancing. Uh, but I also think there's, you know, part of the question was, are there a lot of different strategies uh, that in which you maybe change up the algorithm or change things a little bit to make uh, these sorts of algorithms more useful? And I think there's a lot to be said by pre-training, uh, where you start making use of clever classical algorithms to get circuits that are somewhat optimized. They get you off barren plateaus and these other sorts of things that have been talked about in the literature. And then you use quantum computers as a refinement step 
There's also been discussions of using uh, algor no, uh, decent wave function or decent state preparation as input into other sorts of algorithms out there, such as Monte Carlo techniques and things like that. So I am optimistic that we will be able to see some quantum advantage uh, with variational algorithms. Uh, and I'd say the main X factor isn't necessarily whether it will be useful or not. It's whether there are other algorithms that overtake it in some sense when we go to the fault tolerant error. Uh, whether or not, you know, and this is part of my research to some extent, I develop new algorithms all the time. Other people are developing new algorithms all the time. Uh, there, it's not a static field. So if we were to just freeze all the other algorithms right now, I bet variational algorithms will have, a, uh, you know, will eventually cat, uh, will eventually be extremely useful in the future. If people keep developing new algorithms, especially as we move to the fault tolerant error, we might have a whole another set of techniques that we can use. There are already a lot of other algorithms also that can be used in fault tolerant error. Uh, so it's hard to predict the future, but I'm still investigating it. And I know a lot of other people are still trying to push to make variational algorithms as useful as they can be. Uh, for both near-term and fault-tolerant hardware. Right, thank you. Um, and, and, and I also noticed that uh, Kareem has turned this video on, so maybe uh, do you have a, a follow-up question? Um, and also would uh, encourage the rest of the panel to chime in uh, with perspectives on variational algorithms. Um, thank you. Thank much. I appreciate it. But uh, maybe if I follow up with the algorithm, what do you think about QPE taking charge uh, or replacing variational uh, algorithms at some point? I Is that directly that's... towards me or to somebody else? Yes. Yes. Towards me. Uh, um, I think the issue with QPE, uh, and this is, you know, I've written a lot of papers in this direction. And I know there's even been some more pretty uh, substantial papers that have come out in the last few months by other groups. Um, we're going to have to do state preparation to make quantum phase estimation work. Uh, to do state preparation, you have to do something to get a good ground state. It might be adiabatic state preparation. It might be some form of QAOA. Uh, it might be variational quantum eigen solver. I don't know, but I know all of those have significant computational bottlenecks. And it's not clear to me which one of those, or if there's something else that comes out in the future, or if I'm missing something right now, those are like three of the main state prep algorithms I deal with on a regular basis. I honestly don't know what's going to happen with those three algorithms in the fault tolerant error. There's a lot of discussion that you're not going to want to do variational algorithms because of all the measurements you have to make when you're in the fault tolerant error. And that the time evolution type algorithms like QAOA, like uh, adiabatic state of preparation might be better. But I still think it's up in the air a little bit. And I still think the variational approaches might make, even if you don't need them necessarily, uh, to make the shortest circuits possible, you're in the fault tolerant error, you can go as long as you want. You still have other issues to consider, like how long do your algorithms run? Just because you're in the fault tolerant error doesn't mean that you're going to wait two years for an algorithm to finish. So you might want, still want short circuits. You still might want to do the shortest circuit you can. You might be only be able to get to that with a variational type of algorithm. So there's lots of trade-offs that, um, there's lots of trade-offs to consider. Uh, and I'm, I'm still investigating myself within my own research to try and figure out the answer to that question. Oh, thank you. Um, I think uh, like looking at the time, I would like to ask Kezra uh, the final question, <clears throat> and and perhaps this is a bit of a, a question that's supposed that's a little bit more peppy. So, <laughs> um, I'd I'd be interested to hear uh, what your perspective is. Um, so, in uh, for classical computing, um, the bang for your buck, i.e., the return on investment, has been proven. And I would be uh, really interested to hear your perspective, um, what that would look like uh, for quantum computing. Um, can you elaborate a little bit exactly what you mean by bang for your buck? <laughs> oh, well, okay. So the um, uh, so, so you can kind of imagine a um, th this idea of an HPC facility as a user facility, right? So it represents a, a fairly large investment um, of money. 
and um, it returns um, both science at scale and also science that can't otherwise be done. Mm -hmm. um, if you now replace the, the um, HPC, the classical HPC facility with either a quantum augmented facility or a quantum facility, what does your return on investment look like? Um, okay, um, let, let me try to answer the closest question that I think <laughs> applies. Uh, it's, um, look, we are, and we have been over the last couple of decades in, in very uncertain uh, waters when it comes to quantum computing, right? Uh, it took more than two decades since the proposition of quantum computing for the very first algorithms to come out, to start coming out in the form of Shor's algorithm and uh, search algorithms and whatnot. Um, and still to this day, the best quantum algorithm designers um, don't really have good intuition for exactly how to design quantum algorithms, right? This is basically, we're still very much learning. And uh, the answer to your question really largely does depend on, on algorithm development. What we do know for sure is that there are uh, complexity classes uh, that kind of separate uh, quantum hard and, and quantum easy and classical hard and, and, and all of that. And um, there, we do know that there are uh, you know, classes of problems that will be vastly easier uh, solved through quantum computing. Uh, what we don't really know is exactly, you know, all, all of that landscape in detail. Where where are the boundaries? And especially in the NISC era and as we approach fault tolerance, where are those boundaries? Where do hybrid algorithms uh, lie? What role do they play? Um, and, um, you know, there are a lot of people who have no-go theorems and talk about how things won't scale and won't work out. And the reality is, you know, history shows us that it always looks like that until somebody does it, right? And so uh, we uh, we're basically uh, uh, we're big believers that uh, we will be able to access uh, those complexity classes, and uh, bang for buck will will not be really a question. Um, how we get there really is the question. Uh, and and the process and that is not at all clear and we all have to kind of work together to figure that part of it out oh thank you i think i, I really like that answer uh, so um i think we are at the top of the hour um i want to once again thank all the panelists uh, for their time and their interesting uh, perspectives and their expertise um and i would like to thank the the audience for um you know having uh, showing interest and 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 you know just attending and, and asking questions all right um back to you katie and dan johan can I, can I just say one thing so i want i want to thank all the panelists also this was really a great discussion and um, i really appreciated uh amongst uh, many others the the one comment about the a place like nursk uh, and the department of energy having this infrastructure that that we have the the knowledge and the the know-how and the, and we we you know we interact um, with the end user and with the person trying to trying to do the computation and the the people that are actually running and developing and really have the, the detailed knowledge of the systems and so we do have a long history of that and I think that will be valuable going forward and I, I should have mentioned earlier one thing I, I forgot to mention when I spoke earlier is you know this um this is part of a, a larger effort that NERSC does, which is looking at all kinds of uh, advanced computing technologies from both the near term, the medium term, and the long term. It's, it's kind of on the longer term uh, side. But that group is led by Nick Wright uh, at NERSC. And that, they really did that group really does an excellent job looking, looking at these things. And so if you have questions in this area or even other uh, HPC technology areas, be sure to, to reach out to Nick. He'd be happy to talk to you about it. Thanks. Yeah, thank you, Richard. And uh, thank you again to all the panelists and uh, Johannes for moderating the discussion. Uh, we'll have a 16 minute break now. We'll, we will be back at uh, 20 past the hours for, uh, for our technical presentation.